Good morning. Generally accepted accounting principles, as we discussed before, form the basis of financial statement preparation for public and private corporations. Yet unlike law, science, engineering, mathematics, or philosophy, the application of accounting principles is really not based on fact. It's not based on case law, statutes, regulations, code as in the French code or the Spanish code uh, or the Napoleonic code. It's not based on truths or empirical scientific evidence. And I think it's incredibly important as stewards and fiduciaries of the modern corporation that you pay clear attention to your responsibilities in this area. Because absent you as the gatekeeping profession, protecting the public against financial misstatement, uh, manipulation, and incorrect financials, because of gap is so widely uh, varied and its definition so widely uh, uh, different, there's no other way that the stakeholders will ever be able to understand the true presentation of the financials. So you as stewards, as financial stewards, as uh, corporate stewards, as fiduciaries of the corporate trust, have an incredibly strong ethical responsibility to make sure that what is presented to the publics, to the stakeholders, the employees, the customers, the vendors, the suppliers, the creditors and debtors, is truthful, it's accurate, is not materially misstated. Because absent that, there's no other way that the publics are going to understand that this is a company that they can believe in. Generally accepted accounting principles are based on rules that have evolved over time, regardless, frankly, of their relevance or economic substance. They may be, subject, uh, they may be subjective, like in practice guides. They may be opportunistic, like Enron's mark-to-market valuation of derivatives. And even when they are followed, they can be highly distorted as demonstrated by WorldCom's lease line costs. So let me give you a totally different perspective from the folks at Accounting Coach. What is GAAP, how did it evolve, and who applies it? Because you as fiduciary stewards of the company have an incredibly strong ethical responsibility to make sure that what you say about your company is truthful, it's accurate, and not misstated. I've always argued that GAAP is an art form. It's not founded on scientific principle, quantitative economics, or fact. In fact, among financial institutions, it may be one of the most creative of contemporary art forms in modern finance. And remarkably, over 70 years after the Securities Acts of 33 and 34, its standards were not even formally codified until July 2009. That's pretty amazing. The evolution of generally accepted accounting principles by various organizations and standard setters from the Accounting Research Bulletins to the Accounting Principles Board to currently FASB and AICPA is what I call a conspiracy of like-minded thinking because in the legal profession, a significant number of law professors hold advanced degrees in the social sciences, such as psychology and sociology and political science and engineering. However, this does not seem to be the case among leaders of the CPA profession and the standard setters. The implications are significant. I mean, let's think about this. If you're looking at the five members of the Financial Accounting Standards Board, it's clear that these are brilliant people. But for example, the chief accountant of the SEC, brilliant, successful, highly trusted men and women, general, genuine people of goodwill, but none of them have been schooled or have advanced degrees in the social sciences. Many only have BS degrees, and it's improbable that they ever took a double major or any significant minor in sociology, diplomacy, political science, government, international relations, or government policy. So effectively, they're not looking at the company through the eyes of the publics or the stakeholders like you are. They're looking at the company from the perspective of, of, of accounting. Now, who are the publics, again, that we need to pay attention to? Well, they're the customers, they're the suppliers, 
They're the employees, they're the investors, they're the rating agencies, and ultimately the citizens at large through their legal representatives and as taxpayers. And these are the publics that we need to pay attention to. So let's take a look at some of the most often misused gap principles and discuss them in, in greater detail. And the first accounting coach talked about revenue recognition. Let's talk about revenue recognition. You might presume that revenue accounting standards have naturally evolved over time so as to be straightforward, robust, and consistent across all transactions, industries, and countries. Sadly today, revenue accounting standards exhibit none of these qualities. Stakeholders are forced to make poor economic decisions as a result. And this was the quote from Bruce Ponder, who's chair of the IMA, the, the Financial Reporting Committee, and president of Leverage Logic. Before Andrew, Arthur Anderson's demise, Arthur Anderson's internal policy manual presented account Arthur Anderson audit partners with dozens and perhaps hundreds of choices on how to recognize revenue. And revenue was one of the top three for the greatest manipulation. You see this all the time when companies get held out by SEC and PCOB and other standard setters for financial manipulation. In the late 90s and early 2000s, shopping for the most aggressive ways to recognize revenue, in fact, the most aggressive public accounting firms to support it, and the least aggressive ways to recognize costs, costs in order to advance company earnings, inflate, inflate shareholder price, were the principles du jour of the accounting professions. Companies could shop for audit services and favorable rec revenue recognition policies like any other business-to-business -business product or services. Revenue recognition technique commonly used by the dot-coms was to advance revenue recognition on multi-year agreements to improve their capitalized value and further demonstrate their skills to increase cash burn rates because companies in the 2000s were valued higher by the greater cash burn rates that they had. And, but it was without having to recognize the long-term obligations and liabilities in the event they actually had to perform the service or had their services canceled. Practice was rampant for startups until the bubble burst, causing thousands of people to lose their jobs, thousands of people to lose their investments, and thousands of people to lose, if not millions of people, to lose a portion of their retirement savings. And incidentally, this similar treatment still exists for retail franchises, where the cost of new construction or leasehold improvements is capitalized. The sheer variety of revenue recognition principles that make the news makes this the number one generally unacceptable accounting principle. Creative employment opportunities still remain in this open field. And here's some of the more creative ones that have been disclosed very recently, and many with the blessing of the auditors. We talked a little about some of them. General Electric's legendary ability to deliver consistent earnings growth. And that comes from the Financial Times. GE settles claims of fraud, agrees to pay $50 million. Financial Times, that was in August of, of 5th of 2009. Xerox, advanced recognition of lease transactions. Paragon's Constructions Accelerated Contract. Paragon Construction re recognized the revenue before the uh, buildings were built. Sunbeam's Channel Stuffing Revenue Upsides. We talked about that. Ride Aid's Revenue Smoothing Techniques. Crazy Eddie, well, he just made up the numbers. Adelphia, Enron, and PNC related party sales. Energy and Dynergy, double booking. Waste management, knowledgeware, and others who manufactured their own creative revenue recognition techniques. Somebody within the company, the fiduciary, the steward, has to have and present ethical principles, not generally accepted accounting principles, in order to prevent the types of financial uh, misrepresentation and manipulation that we see every day you know, in, in the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times. The second area of generally unacceptable accounting principles, in fact, um, the FASBs discussing this right now and how to treat it is what we call fair value accounting. And most accountants, of course, are aware of the history of fair value accounting. It was actually adopted and abandoned in the, in the Great Depression. 
and in practice it's applied inconsistently and unevenly according to a particular asset or uh, asset class. In Europe, many bank assets are treated on a historical basis, that is, when they bought them, what their price was, to avoid any fluctuations inherent in what we call mark-to-market of valuation. That is, marking up an asset if it's worth more today, because the asset could be uh, worth less today also and may have to be marked down. Fair value looks at impairment in value at one instantaneous point in time when there are no market value for the asset or it's a liquid. Compared against the principles of scientific method, which measures data points over dozens of observations in multiple time periods, fair market accounting has ruined the portfolios of Acovia, Washington Mutual, Countrywide, and others. It has led to liquidations of banks throwing hundreds of thousands of employees out of work freezing credit, paralyzing lending, and the housing market for a period of time. William Isaac, former chairman of the FDIC on how to save the financial system, argued, if we do not halt the insanity of forcing financial firms to mark assets to a non-existent market that are realistic economic value, the cancer will plunge the world into very difficult economic times for years to come. What is fact about Fair value accounting, however, is that its application and misuse has been consistent over the years. WorldCom, for example, valued its lease line costs consistent with fair value standards. Enron Skilling, desiring, desiring to accelerate revenue and thus earnings by using mark to market accounting, inevitably led to a treadmill effect, focusing on earnings rather than the cash that led to some crazy deals being done. That's according to the folks, Greed. Uh, Hamilton and Michael uh, Thwait uh, in their book Greed and, and Corporate Failure. Great, great book uh, from Macmillan. Fair value accounting comes in number two after revenue recognition because it is applied, misapplied, revoked, and reinstated, and of course inconsistently applied today. Write downs due to impairment. This principle makes heroes of new company CEOs and destroys legacies of ousted ones. And this is something you have to pay attention to as financial stewards when the management of the company changes and the CEO changes. It ensures multi-year bonuses for the management team leaves stakeholders in the dark and only the rank and file employees know the sleight of hand. And you would know the sleight of hand. It is an art best practiced in bad times when new management comes in to restructure the business and throw out old management. As a former senior M&A and business development executive at a global company, I have seen this mastered by many businesses. The International Accounting Board is looking to curtail, is looking to curtail these abuses, but it remains to be seen whether management's creative judgment can also be curtailed. Here's how it works. In business cycles, the timing of the business cycle is critical. In recession, post 9-11, after the dot-com craze, the telecommunications bust, new management, determines, ter, new management determines that previously acquired or developed products, that is assets, lines of business, or business segments are not performing according to plan. They're just not profitable if all the costs are loaded into this. It's as if there was here an opportunity to load in all costs onto this project. Of course, this is the project from the former CEO. Therefore, they, they maintain it must be written off usually to retain earnings, that is not to the bottom line profit, but to uh, a stockholder paid in capital, or as an extraordinary item, which is now part of the, which is now part of the a profit and loss statement. But it's an extraordinary item. It's not part of the income expenses of the normal company. In essence, new management determines that principal activities core to their business, defined by old management, are no longer core to the new business, are not earning as expected, and due to recession or business cycles, and again, we're going to be seeing a new business cycle coming up pretty soon, or their lack of supportive investment should be written off. And when we reemerge, these products or assets start performing, and even modestly it works. Profit is recorded on the first dollar of sales because all the costs have been written off, while well, acquisition, development, and capitalized expenses have been written off. New management overperforms, 
They're the golden children, the saviors of the company. They get the big bonus. Don't worry until they become what I would say old management where they get thrown out. Accounting Trump shareholders, employees, and the investment community. IFRS, the International Federation of Accounting uh, Reporting folks, the, suggests an upward ad back, but so far that has not been palatable to um, the company management. The fourth area of potential manipulation, which I think is absolutely critical, and you're going to be looking at it as corporate compliance, risk management, as fiduciary stewards, is reliance. The point specifically is auditors hide behind this generally accepted auditing principle. Financial statements are the responsibility of management. They're based on the judgment of management, not on the judgment of accounting firms or auditors. Even though these accounting firms and auditors have probably been auditing the same company for the last hundred years. The problem here is not new and with the darlings of institutional management comes the CEO superstar. A dominant CEO emerges, packs the board in the company with like-minded executives who owe their position to him and are reluctant to challenge his judgment, according to Hamilton and Michael Flade. Reliance on management provides a safe haven for the accounting firm at the expense of the public. But what if the judgment of management is skewed? Its conduct is outrageous and can't be ignored by observations from the outside auditors. Who should reliance remain? Why should reliance remain the overriding principle? And is there a point at which it should be abandoned? And if you don't look at this as fiduciary stewards of the company with a strong ethical backbone, backbone if you don't do it, who else is going to do it? This is how they, they uh, Hamilton and, uh, uh, and, and Micklethwaite uh, discuss this. The dominant CEO, and this is time and time again you see this in public companies, the dominant CEO may begin perhaps unconsciously to behave as though it is his own creation. And as Kozlowski did at Tyco, Ebers at WorldCom, Tansy at Parmalat, use the company as his piggy bank. This is when shareholders, stakeholders, and the board become irrelevant. But as you'll see, the issue repeats every few years. It's structurally endemic to our system. About 100 years ago, the classic Harvard economist warned, in the US where the tradition, and we discussed this a little, where the tradition of checks and balances continues to shape political organization, directors and great corporations are often no more than figureheads, while presidents are benevolent despots. Juries ultimately will decide the convictions and the awards for companies like the CEO involved in Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch, Countrywide, the feeder operations of Stanford, Madoff, Dreyer, Sky Capital, the thousands of suspicious activity frauds reported by the securities and futures industry. But in each, each case, there's probably in-house counsel, a enterprise risk manager, manager and the CEO, the CFO, and others, and the outside, the inside financial executives, the financial managers, and the department uh, CEOs, uh, I'm sorry, the department of CPAs who relied on the judgment of management for the entries they made and the results they presented to the public. Absent your gatekeeping responsibilities, nothing can stop the corporation from misbehaving. The fifth generally unacceptable accounting principle deals, of course, with um, the auditor. And the question is, can a commercial enterprise be independent when it solicits business from the company it ports to be independent of? Let's look at Parmalat and Tyco. In the case of the Parmalat scandal, the Wall Street Journal reported that Deloitte Touche was warned that questions raised by its Brazilian auditor could result in the loss of multi-million dollar worldwide audit engagement. As a result, a footnote disclosure rather than a qualified audit of the subsidiary was reported. It comes right from the Wall Street Journal in March 2004. Or Tyco it was a key client of PricewaterhouseCoopers. Its fees ranged in the $50 million range. 
as Hamilton and Micklethwaite say, it was clear that the audit partner on the engagement, Richard Scalso, knew of the inside and illegal dealings of Tyco senior management and said nothing. 